Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence. Welcome to Bible study. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. A bunch of believers who love the Lord, intimately and unreservedly. We study scriptures line by line, precept upon precept, because we believe in one buys a book and jumps about the paragraphs, the chapters, the sentences. If you read it from start to finish, that way you're able to understand the contents of the book. And since we've been doing that in this fellowship, this is our second go around studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God has been faithful to us. We've grown, we've matured, we're still growing. The Bible says to will come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So we still have quite a ways to go. Amen. But it's been fun working with the Lord and we give him praise. We are in the book of Leviticus, uh, and I do believe we will finish it today. It's just chapters 25, 26, and 27. I'm glad we caught up uh, yesterday because we had a few days where we just only went through one chapter. So we should be done with Leviticus next week, Monday, the Lord willing. We will start on the book of Numbers. Father, we approach your word with much reverence. And with thanksgiving in our hearts for what the word means to us, for what the word does in our lives, for how the word is changing us and establishing us in your truth. Grant insight, grant understanding. Let illumination come. Let our lives never remain the same. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Leviticus 25. The Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thine vine, of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee. And for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in the land shall all the increase thereof be meat. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day, on the seventh month, in the day of atonement, the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession. And ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it, of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the, incre the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. According to this number of, according to the number of the years of the fruits, he sell unto thee. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God. For I am the Lord your God. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land 
in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein safe in safety. And if ye shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for thee three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold for ever, for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a, a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor, and had sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin's any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if a man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of jubilee. And in the jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full, full year may he redeem it. And if, and if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the jubilee. For the houses of, of the villages which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out in the jubilee. Notwithstanding, the cities of the Levites, and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Levites redeem at any time. And if a man purchase of the Levites, then the house that was sold, and the city of his possession, shall go out in the year of jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites at their possession among the children of Israel. For the field of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase, for fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, to give you the land of Canaan, and to be your God. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor, and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondman. But as an hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shall fear thy God, both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen round about you. And them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. 
one of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And it shall reckon, and he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall be according to the number of years. According to the time of an hired servant shall it be with him. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Praise God. Uh, again, uh, God gives more laws. Uh, this one concerning the land and then concerning the year of Jubilee. Um, again, there's nothing really doctrinal as far as we're concerned. Um, there's no more uh, slavery in the New Testament and even in the world that we live in now. So a lot of these things are just informational. Um, of course, there are some, shall I call it, moral admonitions, how to treat one another. Uh, if someone is less than you in in stature, in, in, what's the word I'm looking for? If you're bigger than someone, let me just put it that way, then you treat them well and you treat them right. Not because you're wealthier or because you're stronger or because you're more well positioned or whatever. You, you treat people uh, with disrespect. Truth be told, we all uh, were made in the image and likeness of God. And we are all children of God, um, regardless of how highly positioned you are or how wealthy that you are or whatever it is that you think you have. We have to treat people with respect and we have to treat people kindly. All right. Uh, God told them how to um, allow the land to rest. We were supposed to use the land for six years and on the seventh year, we were supposed to let it rest. Whatever then grew out of the land in that seventh year that they did not labor to to sow, they are not to reap. It's to be meat for the beast of the field, for strangers, and and uh, so on and so forth. But the owner of the land is not to reap it. Um, they also instituted the year of jubilee, which is the fiftieth year. Now, I want to take a minute to talk about the 50th year because I have experienced the Jubilee and the Jubilee is real. I promise you. I turned 50 in, this is 2023. I, I turned 50 in 2020, 2018. No, I turned 16 in 2018, 2008. And my life since that time to this time is incomparable to what it was before then. That was the year that incredible interest came into my life. I took the time to study what the Bible has to say about the year of Jubilee. And this is what I wrote. I'm going to read it to you so that you know. The 50th year is the year God Almighty himself ordained. He ordained it for the singular reason of blessing everyone who would observe this holy requirement of his. Besides being called the year of Jubilee, it is also referred to in scriptures as the year of liberty or the year or the acceptable year of the Lord. It means the same thing. 
Jubilee means a joyful shout or a clangor of trumpets. It lasted for a year, and during this year, the land was to be fallow, and the children of God were only permitted to gather the spontaneous produce of the fields. All landed property during that year reverted to its original owner. <laughs> and all who were slaves were set free. All debts were canceled. The Jubilee year was a year of liberation and restoration, and it was to be celebrated every 50 years. The return of the Jubilee year was proclaimed by a blast of trumpets, which sounded throughout the land. The Jubilee year was to affirm the lordship of God over the whole earth, and it expressed his right to command the obedience of his people. So the 50th year expressed his sovereign ownership of all, land, people, means of production, and life itself. Next, the Jubilee year was to signify redemption. The trumpet that marked the beginning of the Jubilee was sounded on the Day of Atonement. That was the day on which the Lord proclaimed his people clean before him from all their sins. Forgiveness of sins ushered in the Jubilee year. The verb to redeem and the noun redemption had strong commercial undertones. They referred to the recovery of property that had been used as collateral for loans. The divine redemptive act made the redeemed into brothers, brought them into the Lord's servitude, and canceled their bondage. The result of redemption is rest. This rest is vividly illustrated and enforced with the mandated rest from planting and number one, rest from the toil connected with promoting the next year's crops. Two, rest from the toil of harvesting for the people of God were to live hand to mouth, gathering only what and when they needed food. Rest from the anxious burden of debts incurred, that's number three, and rest from slavery, number four. The Lord frees his people, not for unbroken idleness, but for the redirection of life toward himself. The Jubilee year was a deliberate opting out of the rat race. It called to a halt the acquisitiveness of man. It abandoned concern over the pressure to stay alive. It reordered priorities. It's like what happened to us in 2020. It was like God forced a Jubilee year on the entire world. It was said that animals were seen where they ordinarily would not be seen because man was locked up. It's incredible. It reordered priorities and it gave a chance to appraise the use of time and the selection of objectives. For a whole year, the people of God stood back, rested, stopped pursuing the good in order to get the very best from God. The very state of rest was required of them. Point number two, the exercise of quiet faith and confidence that throughout the whole year, the God of the Jubilee year was more than able to provide for their every need. He is Jehovah El Shaddai, the many-breasted one from whom all his children could suckle, regardless of their need or numbers. And it is into this significant 50th year that I have stepped into. And may the God of Jubilee grant me and all my loved ones all the blessings of the Jubilee year. That's what I wrote for myself. In a nutshell, God set everybody free from every kind of debt. And if we took God seriously and we take his word seriously, he can redeem us from every debt that we currently have right now. Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. A mortgage is the single heaviest debt that anybody carries if you own a property. It is, it is so oppressive. I can't even begin to describe it. If you are challenged with paying rent, Imagine that challenge a hundred times over when it comes to mortgage. 
Because when you rent a house, when you rent a, an apartment, you don't have any skin in the game. You don't. But if you buy a house, your down payment is at stake. The amount of money, however much it is, that you spend on maintaining the house and keeping the house is at stake. Because once they take back the house, when you default, all of that is gone. So you have a lot more to lose when you own property than when you're leasing or you're renting. And this is one of the reasons why I do know that God is able to cancel the debt. And as we beseech him concerning every debt in our lives, specifically the church building, I know that God will cancel it. The how, I may not know. The when, I may not know. But I know that he will do that which we have asked him to do. We've been praying this prayer in the last one year. That we want the debt canceled in a year. And all God needs is one man and a check. I use that word man in a generic sense. It will be a woman that he will bring forth. I will write one check. Half a million to some people is like, you can change. They'll give it out. They won't even feel it. And I know God will do that for us. All right. So that's so much about the Jubilee. Um, and then uh, from verse 8, God instituted the law of the year of Jubilee, which I just read out to you. The law of the land was uh, verses 1 through 7. They would announce it uh, with a trumpet on the Day of Atonement. That was the day God cleaned all of the sin of the nation of Israel. Each worshiper would come to uh, offer a lamb or whatever the animal was, a bullock, uh, for the atonement of his sin and his family. But once in a year, a high priest went into the most holy place to offer sacrifice for the atonement of the entire nation. And Israel still does it till today. I told you the Yom Kippur War, when all the Arab nations came against that tiny uh, piece of land that's surrounded by all of them, they made the mistake of coming on the Day of Atonement. And God showed up and God discomfited them. They could not believe what happened. Read up on it. I'm sure there are also videos out there that you can watch how God delivered Israel uh, in a supernatural way. So the 50th year is very significant. If you're approaching 50, you should be rejoicing. Because if you understand what it involves, your life will change. In in that year, 2008, I, I, I got a job as the MD CEO of a bank subsidiary. You all know that that's, that's not qualification. And that's not even contact. And I was MD CEO of the bank from 2008 to 2016. It was my gift that opened the door for the MD CEO of the bank, whose subsidiary it was, to say to me, can you can you pull us out of the mess we're in? We see that you, you know what you're doing. And in the eight years that I was with them, eight, no, was it eight years? Yeah. In the eight years that I was with them, I turned the company around. Not because of qualification, but because of the blessing of God. I knew what to do, even though I was not a professional. I would go to meetings scared stiff. Praying that they don't ask me any technical questions. But I built I built two housing estates while I worked. I did so many other projects for them. And I'm not an engineer, I'm not an architect, I'm not, I'm, no. I don't have any education in that area at all. It was just the spirit of God and the gifts that he had given me. And because I believed what I studied before I turned 50. So God can do the same thing for you. He can cancel all of your debts. Every single one of them, he can. All it takes is just one door to open for you. And all of those things will be gone. 
The children of Israel said, when the Lord turned away our captivity, we were like them that dreamt. It's going to be like a dream. Since then was our mouth filled with laughter and our hearts with singing. There's nothing that's going on in your life that God cannot turn around for you. You just must know how to believe and trust him for it. All right. Uh, the next section, God talks about that I want to read out. Um, God said in verse 5, No, that's not where I want it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah. When they said to God, um, how are we going to survive the seventh year? You said we shouldn't plant. You said we shouldn't uh, reap. We shouldn't do anything. And God answered him, answered them in verse 19. The land shall ye yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fuel and dwell therein in safety. If you're complaining, verse 20, that how are we going to Manage that seventh year. God said, I will command. It's like Psalm 133 that says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Verse 3 says, For there the Lord commands his blessing. It's not blessing that will be happenstance. It's not blessing that will be somebody decided. God is going to command it. And if God commands it, who can reverse it? What can reverse it? He said, I'm going to command a blessing upon your sixth year. It will produce fruit that will last three years. That's why his name is Jehovah El Shaddai. That's why he's your Jehovah Jireh. We really should not be in lack. If we understand that our heavenly bank accounts... I don't even know how to describe it. We have access to all the resources of heaven. We do. The challenge is how are we using the resources? Is God pleased to release more to you? Are you obeying the laws of prosperity? Because they are laws. If you don't obey them, you will be in penury. You'll be robbing Peter to pay Paul and you will never be balanced. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Luke 6, 38. Do you give? Or you are all about yourself and your needs and what you want. He told you to tithe. Malachi chapter 3 and this Leviticus, the last uh, chapter 27, we're going to come to it in a minute. Do you tithe? Or you're bothered about the fact that the pastor is going to use your money. That's not your concern. You cannot cut off your nose to spite your face. God said I should tithe. I will tithe. If my pastor thinks he can eat my tithe and get away with it, he has another thing coming. Because there's a God in heaven. The Bible says all things lie naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Please put that scripture up for me. You give your heart earned money and he decides to go and buy whatever or live opulently I, I still cannot understand or justify a 50 bedroom mansion are you mad you can only sleep in one room on one bed on one side of the bed on one side of your body at any given time. Makes no kind of sense that there should be poverty on this planet Earth when four, four men in this United States of America can eradicate world poverty. Four men. There'll be people who go to bed night after night after night after night with no food. Children crying because of hunger. People still living in thatched homes. Yeah. 
with a mat on the mud floor. If you go on a mission trip once, you will never be the same again. Yet we still complain, living in this kind of country. God said, I will command the, the earth to bring forth fruit for three solid years. Beyond that one year that you are going to not reap anything. Two extra years. I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. It shall bring forth fruit for thee three years. Verse 21. Verse 22. You will sow in the eighth. You will be eating from the one that the sixth year gave you. Verse 21. At 22. You will sow in the eighth year. You will yet be eating of the old fruit until the ninth year because your sixth year will produce three years increase. This is the God we serve. And in the eighth year, you will eat yet of the old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in and you shall eat of the old store. And then he commanded them not to sell the land forever because the land belongs to him. He just gave it to them. They are strangers, they are sojourners with him in the land of Canaan. And then he told them, he said, in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. That means you will bring an offering. A redemption means you give something in exchange for something else. You redeem the land by bringing an offering to God. Then he talks about the law of land, the redemption of inheritance. If a brother becomes poor, either through a bad business decision or a calamity befalls him or whatever, and he sell and he has had to sell something that belonged to him, any of his kin, cousins, brothers can come and redeem that thing. And you that he sold it to, you must let it go. If there's no one to redeem it, but he has made enough money to come back and redeem what he sold to you, God said you must let it go. If he sells a dwelling, verse 29, in a walled city, he will he is allowed to redeem it within a year. If he's not able to redeem it within that year, then it has to wait till the year of Jubilee before it comes back to him. But if the houses have no, and the villages have no walls around them, it's regarded as uh, the outskirts, the fields of the country, verse 31. They may be redeemed, and they can go out in the year of Jubilee. However, God makes an exception with the Levites, simply because when the Levites came into the land, God said they were not to be given any land, that he was their possession, a reward. The cities, and we're going to come to it later on because the Bible explains this portion uh, better. The cities that were left for them, because there were areas left for the Levites, is what he's referring to in verse 33. If a man purchases of the Levites, then the house that was sold and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. All right. But the field and the suburbs of their cities of the Levites may not be sold. It is the perpetual possession of the Levites. Again, it talks about the law of the land in verse 35. If, if a brother, a uh, fellow Israelite, uh, has become poor or fallen in decay, uh, you will relieve him. And though he be a stranger and sojourner, that he may live with you. Do not take any interest, usury, from him. Or give him anything with the hope of getting some kind of increase from what you've given to your brother. That's why Islamic banking, they don't charge interest. A whole bunch of them came into Nigeria several years ago. And, and really sad, some Christians suddenly became Habib and Hakim and Wakilu so that they could get loans without interest. 
But then in the scriptures too, God tells us not to charge interest. Psalms 15. The reading three. The Holy Ghost says, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Question. Answer. He who walks uprightly, he who works righteousness, he who speaks the truth in his heart, he who does not bite with his tongue, he who does not do evil to his neighbor, he who does not take up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. He has no tolerance for a vile person. But he honors them that fear the Lord. This man that is going to be able to abide in, the, in God's tabernacle and dwell in God's holy hill, the Bible says he will swear to his own hurt and he will not change. If he has said, I will do something, he will die doing it. He won't change. He does not put out his money to usury. A man who will abide in the tabernacle of God, who will dwell in his holy hill, will not loan money to a fellow brother or sister and ask for interest. That's why it's evil when you loan money and you don't pay it back. The Bible calls you wicked. The best thing to do when you don't have it, you call your benefactor. I remember that I still owe you this, that, and the other. I'm still challenged. I haven't forgotten. Please give me more time. That's the noble thing to do. You don't act like you don't remember. You don't act like you don't, you don't mention it. You just carry on with life as if nothing is the matter. It is the favor of God that causes a man to loan you money when you are down. Because anybody who understands money knows you don't give money to somebody who doesn't have money. That's why the bank will ask you what you ate last night, where you slept, who your mother is, who your great-grandfather is, before they loan you any money. They want to know everything about you before they loan you money. But you're in a bad situation, somebody has mercy on you, and, and the favor of God is ignited and they help you out. And you don't come back. You don't call. You don't talk about it. You just act like nothing happened. So the righteous man does not put out his money to usury. And he doesn't take a reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never, never be moved. Back in Leviticus. Uh, verse 35, that's where we were. If your brother waxes poor and he has fallen into decay, default, he's not able to help himself, then you will relieve him if he's a stranger or sojourner so that he may continue to live with you. Do not take any interest of the money. Fear God so that your brother can continue to live with you. Uh, don't give him your money with interest. Don't lend him anything, victuals, anything that you give to him for increase. God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If your brother wax is poor, you cannot sell him out as a slave. Because back in the day, if you couldn't pay your uh, whatever you owed, you could be sold. You remember when the widow woman came to Elisha? I believe it's... Uh, I want to say 2 Kings. Don't check 2 Kings 4. I'm not sure. All right. She came to Elisha and she said, Elisha, I'm in trouble. Her husband has died and he left a debt and the creditors have come to take away my two boys. I don't have any money to pay them. It was, it was legal back in the day. And Eli Elisha said to her, well, what do you have at home? Do you have any vessels? She said, yes, I do. He said, all right, borrow many vessels. Borrow not a few. That is to say, expand your capacity to receive. Okay? And as long as this woman had basins, 
to receive the oil that was supernaturally provided for her to sell. As long as she still had vessels, the oil never ran dry. It was when she no longer had that the oil ran dry. She had enough to pay the creditors and to redeem her two boys. His name is El Shaddai, the many-breasted one. You cannot sell your brother because he owes you money. Uh, not as a bond servant. A bond servant, two types of servants uh, mentioned in the Bible, the bond servant and the hired servant. The bond servant you owned. Lock, stock, and barrel. You got married, you owned his wife. You had children, you owned his children. The hired servant you hired, they came around, did the task, you paid them, and they went away. All right, that's why Paul would say, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, Jesus who owned him. And we are bond servants too, even though we're sons, we're still bond servants because he owns us. He owns everything that we own. All right. You will treat him as a hired servant, uh, but not as a bond servant. You cannot be harsh with him. You cannot rule over him with rigor. You cannot work him to the death, say, uh, because he owes you money, he has to pay by what you call it. All right? Also, he talks about the law of the land. Uh, he continues to talk about the law of the land. Um, if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich and your brother that dwells by him wax poor and decides to sell himself when he cannot redeem what he owes. All right. Uh, after he's sold, another Israelite can come and redeem him. One of his brothers can come and redeem, redeem him. His uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him or anyone that is nigh of kin. All right. I think that's all. Do you have any questions? Any thoughts or, or comments? Santa, good morning. Good morning. Yes, ma'am. Just really quickly, when we were back in Psalms um, 15.5, when you talked about how he doesn't um, charge interest or take a reward against the innocent. Can you um, explain the take a reward against the innocent, what that means? He doesn't bear false witness. Oh, okay. No. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, chapter 26. He shall make you no idols, no graven image, Neither rear you up a standing image. Neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you to walk upright. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, or that ye break my covenant, I 
also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land <clears throat> yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number. And your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you. And I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. When ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered unto the hand of the enemy. When I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chase, chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries into desolation. And I will not smell the savour of your sweet odours. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you. And your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest. But it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a, faint, a faintness into their hearts, in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of the shaking leaf shall chase them. And they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursue it. And they shall fall upon, they shall fall one upon another, as it were before the sword, when none pursueth. Ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies, and ye shall perish among the heathen. And the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in the iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember, and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despised my judgments, and because they, their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly or to break my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, 
that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Thank you, Lord. Laws concerning the land uh, and the conditional blessings. I told you, I said the spirit world is very transactional and conditional. Even with Satan, it's like that. If you do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, I will not do this. Um, nothing goes for nothing in the spirit realm. And so God was explaining to them, he re-emphasizes uh, the issue of strange gods, graven images, and idols, because that was why he took the land from the children of Canaan and he's giving them to his children. Uh, they cannot now enter the land and be doing the exact same thing that those people were doing. Prior for you and I is that when we were in the world, we did whatever we wanted. Or well, once he saved us and took us out of the world and brought us into his marvelous light, even though we're still in the world, we are not of the world. And so we cannot live the way the world lives. God is saying to them, you're coming into Canaan, the promised land. You cannot copy their customs, you cannot copy their manners. You cannot copy the way they do things. You've got to be different. In the New Testament, it's put like this. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Our word is still running and it still holds true today. Scripture says evil company corrupts good manners. I had occasion to minister to one young lady who joined this fellowship at the inception in 2019. Very faithful, coming regularly. She's not here anymore coming regularly, calling me to ask questions, excited about the new birth and all that. On one occasion that she went out with a whole bunch of the kids that were in the same company that she worked in, they spiked her drink. And somebody raped her. It took the grace of God to restore her. It took several months of prayer and counseling and talking to her. I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to go physically to the state that she lived in. But if I could have, I would have gone. Fortunately, she told me she didn't get pregnant by it. I hope that's the truth. Because she might have, and she might have aborted it, but I want to believe that she told me the truth. But the pain it's one thing to voluntarily give yourself to a man. It's another thing to be drugged and then taken advantage of. But I do believe that God, in his infinite mercy, would have not only healed her, but removed whatever scars that one moment of indiscretion caused. That's why when I go anywhere, nobody opens my drink. I open it by myself. Give me the opener. I'll open it by myself. Because you never know. Don't go and pour me a drink. Bring the can. I'll open it by myself. Bring the bottle. I will open it by myself. There's evil out there. People of God. It's sad, but it's true. God is particular about all these graven images and, and whatnot. He said, don't bow down to them. Why? Because he's the Lord your God. He says, keep the Sabbath, reverence my sanctuary. It's tough to keep Sabbath now because like I told you, we're like slaves to the people who control our lives. We keep talking about a democracy. They think we're fools. It's not a democracy that we're in. They're doing what they want, when they want, how they want. And it's not even the people that we voted into power as making those decisions. Anyone who thinks the government is the one making the decisions in this country is sadly somewhere misguided. Let me be kind. It's corporate America. 
is the people who fund their campaigns who ultimately bend their hands behind their back. Until we begin to vote wisely, especially as Christians. Until we begin to vote based on the word of God. Not on party lines. Your allegiance is to God and his church. Before any other. That is even if there is to be any other allegiance. I, I owe no allegiance to nothing. No one. Except God. You want to kill me? Go and bring your, your AK-47 on fire. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. We've we've been fooled, we've been we've been lied to, we've been deceived, and it's time we started to vote sensibly. And if there are mechanisms to hold them accountable, we have to begin to engage those mechanisms. Because ultimately, when when the Bible says when the righteous are in power, look for it, it's in the book of Proverbs, the people rejoice. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 29.2 When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Are we not mourning now? Women being kidnapped and sex trafficked and, and raped and murdered our children. <laughs> I have to do that National Day of Children's Prayer. A couple of days ago, God took me into archives. I found the notes. Remember I told you I didn't know where it was? I found it. And we're going to start one way or the other. I don't care if we're five that started with five children. We have to do it. God says he wants to hear the cry of the children. And he's told me this a long time ago. I told you I was scared. I, I did not know how to go about it. The National Children's Day of Prayer is a program under the That was the organization I was going to work with before. The concept of the NCDP, National Children's Day of Prayer, is drawn from the need to imbibe a sense of awareness of the state of this country. It aims at creating a consciousness in youths, especially children, of the fact that for a, ple for a pleasant present and future, the blessings of God are needed program would aim to raise a minimum of a million children. Ultimately, maybe that's where we'll go. This is all of it. I wrote it down. And I just stumbled it on it two days ago. I'm going to quicken that again. I will we'll do something about it. It's It's really sad. All the children in Maui are missing. Where did they go? Someone sent me a video. Um, map quest um, overhead shot of where they where they park all the places. The number of buses parked before the fire. The number of buses parked after the fire. Like almost, I want to say 20-something buses or 30-something buses after the fire. And there was no fire in the area where the buses were parked. After the fire, maybe a bus is left. Where are the buses and where are the children? our fault. 
It's our fault. And we need to repent and ask God to sovereignly begin to intervene in these matters. The church has been MIA. God said, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, all of these blessings will accrue. I will give you rain in due season. The land will yield its increase. The trees of the field will yield their fruit. While you are threshing the floor, the vintage, the ones that you have pressed and made into wine, are still in excess. And it will it will still be available until you start to sow for the new vines. You will eat your bread to the full. You will dwell in your land in safety. You will never run out of supply. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care how tight it gets. If you are walking with the Lord. If he said, I have been young. Now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed begging bread. It's not the number of hours that you work that provides for you. It's Jehovah that provides for you. When you take his 10% out of what you earn, he stretches them beyond even 100%. I'm telling you the truth. Fear is what holds people back from giving. I don't have. It's not possible that you don't have. Absolutely impossible. I sent the flyers for Ghana to someone. And I know their state. That's the reason why I sent it. The person wrote back to me and said, I wish I could help. I can't. I said, you have one unit of your currency. Just one unit, one naira, one CD, one peswa, one dollar, one pound, one mark, one yen, one of your country's currency. Go outside, look for a poor person and give it to that person and say to God, this is for the Ghana missions trip. And watch what God will do. Whether they did it or not, I don't know. They didn't get back to me. People don't understand. It's not how much you give. It's the heart with which you give. If, if, if we say let people give, it's not because we don't have to go. I bought my ticket a long time ago. I told you the first time I checked, it was 1600 The next time I checked, it was 1875 I bought it that day. I have places to stay in Ghana. My father's house, my father's building is in Cape Coast. That's where he died. His wife and his two children, my half-siblings, are there. I don't need a place to stay in Ghana. But it's so that you can be a part of the blessing. This individual said, I don't have. You can't tell me you don't have one dollar. You can't tell me you don't have one pound. You can't tell me you don't have one, one naira. You can't tell me you don't have one German mark. You can't tell me you don't have one French franc. One. Just go outside. The God who knows your state that you really and truly do not have. If you take one unit of your currency and say, Father, you see me. But I want to be a part of what is being done. Here is for this poor person. Lord, it is for the Ghana missions. You'll be amazed what God will do in your life. You cannot let fear hold you back from giving. You cannot let fear hold you back from being merciful. You can't. While we were looking for this $12,000, ask Jay, I have given more than $2,000 out. Because I know that it's in sowing that I reap. 
Ask her, she'll tell you. I'm not teaching what I'm not practicing. I wouldn't dare. God said you will never run out of supply. Before you finish the old one in the house, the new one has come in. You will be moving old stuff out for you to be able to store new stuff. I looked at my wardrobe the other day and I'm like, my God. I wish I had the means to just ship everything out. God says, I will give peace in the land. Verse 6, you will lie down. No one will make you afraid. I will read evil beasts out of the land and there will be no wars. No sword will go through your land. You rather will chase your enemies and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred people. A hundred of you will chase 10,000 people. And that's how it's been for Israel. No country has been able to subdue or subjugate this country. As tiny as they are. God says, I will have respect unto you. I will make you fruitful. I will multiply you. I will establish my covenant with you. I will dwell amongst you. And my soul will not abhor you. I will walk amongst you. I will be your God and you will my people. Because I'm the Lord your God who redeemed you out of the yoke of bondage. God says, if you don't do these things, then I will remove my hand of favor. I will remove my hand of protection. And once God removes his hand, Satan will have a field day. He will have a field day. Sickness, verse 16. I will come to you. I will even appoint over you terror, fear, consumption, and burning ague. Consumption is the old English word for tuberculosis. Guys, it is possible to live in divine health. I'm telling you the truth. It's possible. If you're serving God, if you're truly serving God, these are things you're holding, you, you, you hold him to task about. You said you will take away sickness from the midst of us. Lord, what right has Satan got to put this on my body? Diabetes, cancer, what? What right does he have to afflict you if you're living right? Don't tell me as you age, this one happens. It's a lie. At 65, I don't have one single sickness in my body. Not one. It's not a question of genetics because I have siblings and they have issues. It's the word that keeps you the radical way that you believe God. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. That means with faith, you please him. Don't tolerate sickness in your body. Don't tolerate lack in your life. You're a child of the most high God. Said so I will set my face against you. I won't help you again. I'll take my hands off your life. And your enemies and those that hate you will reign over you. You will not have rest. You will, you will flee when no one is pursuing you. God says, I will make the land so hard, make heaven so hard. You will till the land in vain. It will not yield its increase. It's full of chastisement. I don't want to you know, emphasize on that. But it is true that if your ways do not please the Lord, there's no way you can live peaceably. In verse 32, God says he will disperse them. I will bring, and I will bring the land into desolation and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at, at it. 
I will scatter you among the heathen. I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And God did exactly that. They were scattered all over the earth. That's why you have Polish Jews, you have German Jews, you have American Jews, you have all kinds of Jews. Because that's where they found themselves. Until May 14, 1948, United Nations voted on November 29, 1947, that they should give them that tiny strip of land that they now have. The land that God gave them started from Lebanon to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia then spread into West Africa. So you're looking at all of West Africa, right down to East Africa, all the way up north to Lebanon, including Saudi Arabia. A lot of artifacts have been discovered in Saudi Arabia that the Saudi government is sitting on because they do not want to corroborate the records of scriptures. But in the fullness of time, the truth will come out. When their shape becomes born again, then they will know. Because God has a plan for them. Ishmael is their father and Ishmael is Abraham's son. They will yet be saved. Uh, important. Verse 40. God is a loving God. He says if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and they confess their trespasses against him, things that have made them walk contrary to him, that has also caused him to walk contrary to them. God says in verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, and my covenant with the land. So God is always willing to forgive. He's always willing to restore. My thing is, why get into trouble at all? Why don't I just keep my nose clean? Amen. God promises that he will redeem them, gather them, and bring them back to their land. And that's exactly what he did. Any thoughts, any questions? Any comments? All right. Okay, Dawn. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted, as we were reading this, I just wanted to say thank God for the forefathers, Moses. For Moses, I, I mean... If it wasn't for the for, their forefathers, they would have been wiped out. Yep. So we Moses can look back. On, Go ahead. And I, I, I look back on my life because I can remember where I was and what I was doing. I know it had to be the prayers of my grandmother, uh, my great grandma, because I would have been out of here a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Moses was was. I mean, he found uncommon favor before God. Every civilized nation today have set up their judicial system based on these things. And they're fighting it. All of this, uh, we're gay, we're queer, we're coming for your children. They don't realize that it's because of the laws of Moses that they even got any rights. Although the, what they fought for and they got is an abomination before the Lord. But it's because of the, the justness of the laws of God. Because even to Satan, God is just. Imagine that he still has access before the Father. Man, I accuse you and I. Is that not just? If I was God, he will never see my presence again. After you rebelled against me, then you are coming back to say what? To report the people I have redeemed to me. To report my children to me. And you are out of favor. You won't even be able to come before my presence. So you will not be able to report them. 
But God is just. He still allows Satan to come and lay his case. I am rejoicing that I'm not God. Because I won't, I won't stand, I won't even have one leg to stand on. He's so just. And thank God for the prayers of grandmas and great grandmas. I know mine pray for me. You know, I, I think I think to myself that he must have had a reason for saving me at 17. Because if he didn't save me at 17, only God knows what I would have become. It was like, ah, I see the trajectory of that life. Well, get her now. Get her now. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Chapter 27 and the last chapter. Father, we thank you. That's when you have two hands up, Sean oh, and Sean beg, and then Miss Laura. I beg your pardon. Um, I'll tell you why I missed those hands. And I don't mean anything by it. Don't crucify me. I notice the yellow ones. I don't notice the brown ones. Because they are either up against some of the dark part of the screen or something. So please pardon me. Sean, go ahead. Okay, I will change mine to yellow. <laughs> thank you. Okay, how are you? I'm well, thank God. Good. Uh, I was just thinking when you were, when you were reading over how um, if the person lost their house, then they had X amount of time to come back. And I was just thinking about today, how, um, as they call it, the gentrification of neighborhoods and such, and how, you know, the people go in and get homes um, because of tax default. And if they were given that opportunity to come up with the money to then come back and get their homes, how, you know, good that would be in certain circumstances. But it's just a thought. But um, uh, the greed of men will not allow that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But if that were a law, that would just, you know, that would be really awesome. be right. Because... That's why we need to vote. That's why we need to vote the right kind of people into the office of whatever. Hmm. Who make decisions about our lives. If we see anything that they're doing that's contrary to the word. I judge people based on this book. Mm -hmm. I, I said something maybe two, this is 2023, 2022, 2021, 2020. Yeah, 2019. I said something and people left the fellowship. I said, I cannot vote for a Democrat because of this abortion thing. It's 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 a huge thing with me. Abortion steals a beating heart. No matter how you want to slice it. And several people got offended and left the fellowship. Fellowship is still alive till today. We, we, we have to be more responsible with the... What am I even saying? The part of my mind is even telling me, do our votes really count? Mm -hmm. Does it really, really count? Right. Or they have pre-selected whoever they want to put there. Lord Jesus. I had one more question or yes, I guess. Uh, so you mentioned, um, you know, paying back those that we owe. So in that circumstance, um, when say I come up with the money and I owe somebody and then I also need to pay tithes, what do I do first? Does it matter or? The tithe first. Oh, okay. That goes to God who brings Okay. You give God the tithe so that the blessings can accrue to you. And if what you have left is not enough to pay all of the debt, at least pay part of it. I, I don't know of anyone that is owed. Uh, say I owe you $10 or you owe me $10 and you come and you say, Pastor Mo, I don't have $10 right now, but I do have five. I'm going to say, go away. I don't want your five. Go and bring my 10 I don't know of anybody who does that. You'll at least take the five and hope that they come back with the remaining five. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I would give my tithe. I, I don't mess with the tithe. As a matter of fact, to the praise and glory of Almighty God, I'm beyond tithing. There's no percentage that I cannot give God. I can give him every single thing I have. But I would do that first because it's not my money. His tithe is not mine. So I gotta take his out. I mean, think about it. If 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 I come to you and I say, here's ten dollars, Sean. Spend nine, do whatever you like with nine dollars, but please save a dollar for me. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to pick up the dollar. And I come back and I say, Sean, may I have my one dollar? And you are telling me, well, what had happened was <laughs> what, what could have happened? I gave you nine. I said, keep one. That's the way you should look at the tithe. Mm -hmm. I told you one rabbi that I follow on uh, on a YouTube. He says the way he looks at it is I have a boss who gives me 90% commission. Mm -hmm. I would be evil to touch the 10 that belongs to the corporation. That that just, it just reinforced what I had already known or believed. If you think about it in that light, so I would give God his tithe first and then I would plead with my benefactor to give me a little more time. I have this much. Can I give it? And if they say, no, 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 no I will insist because I don't know when I will have again. Mm. Please take this one and let me know that I, I've at least reduced the debt. I'm working on it. I will pay what I owe. Okay. Yeah. And that's tithing off of any money that we receive in, correct? Because I know you mentioned. Tithing is off of your increase. Okay. Any, okay. Laura? Hello. I, I'm hoping it's unmuted. I thought that it was settled yesterday. Yes. Um, these scriptures are just so um, timely. And like I believe that in knowing God, which is taught here, we get to know ourselves. And I'm just praying mightily for um, Mark, who... It was under suicide watch um, and moved to another um, place. And he doesn't want to hear about God. Um, so I have respected him. And through intercession and intervention, I, you know, I go to God um, pleading for um, Mark to be able to know himself by um knowing God and he's just so very angry um and in this time I had told you that I was um reading Believer's Authority which I've read multiple times by Hagen and by mistake I purchased a second book which I want um do you know Andrew Womack I've heard about him yes well um he Chapter 27, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by the, thy estimation. And thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old, even unto 60 years old. Even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. And if it be from five years old, even unto 20 years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male, 20 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. And if it be from a month old, even unto five years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male, five shekels of silver, and for the female, thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. But if he be poorer than thy estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him according to his ability that vowed shall, he, shall the priest value him. And if it be a beast whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. He shall not alter it, nor change it, a good for a bad or a bad for a good. 
if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest. And the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad. As thou valuest it, who art the priest, so shall it be. But if he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part thereof unto thy estimation. And when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad. As the priest shall estimate it, so shall it stand. And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of the estimation unto it, and it shall be his. And if any man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of the field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof, and homer of barley seed shall be valued at fifty shekels. And if he sanctify his field from the year of jubilee, according to thy estimation, it shall stand. But if he sanctify his field after the jubilee, then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of the jubilee, and it shall be abated from thy estimation. And if he that sanctify the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. And if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field when it goeth out in the jubilee shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted. The possession thereof shall be the priests. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought, which is not of the fields of his possession, then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even unto the year of the jubilee, and he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. In the year of the jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought, even to him to whom the possession of the land did belong. And all thy estimations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty jerahs shall be the shekel. Only the firstling of the beasts, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it. Whether it be ox or sheep, it shall it is the Lord's. And if it be of an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation, and shall add a fifth part of it thereto. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to thy estimation. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, or shall surely be put to death. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And according and concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments of the Lord, which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Sinai. All right. So the last set of laws that we read about concerns things that are avowed to God or dedicated or separated unto God. All right? Um, when a man makes a vow, the person shall be for the Lord by estimation. So the priest should, will estimate if it's a meal, um, 20 years to 60 years, a certain amount, above 60, a certain amount. If it's a female, uh, they to have a certain amount, although it's less than the man. Um, sometimes when I read these things, I I can't help but think of women who think equality with men um, means that men shouldn't do what God said they should do for them. The truth of the matter is, I don't need to fight for what's mine. Scripture already tells me that we're equal. We're joint heirs 
right? But when it comes to assignments, when it comes to responsibilities, God divided those up differently. A man is supposed to look after his wife. That's a God-given mandate. So to fetch me a chair to sit down, to open the door for me to come in the house or get in, in the car or whatever, you're not doing those things um, because you are superior to me. No, you're doing it because your God commands you to do it. You're not doing it for me because I'm inferior to you. You're doing it because your God commands you to do it. It's not that I can't carry a chair. It's not that I cannot open a door. It's not that I cannot go out and work and feed myself. But well, God gave you the responsibility. Now, of course, there will be there will be times where things are not quite the way that they ought to be. Say, for instance, he's laid off work and his income is not what it used to be. Because we're a team, because we're one, because we're married. My money is his money. There's no my money, your money in a marriage. Nothing like that. I always counsel with married couples, have three accounts. There's one joint one and there's two separate ones. One for him, one for her. Every resource of the family comes into that one joint account. It doesn't matter in what percentage. I come with 50, you come with 50, I come with 80, you come with 30, you come with 99, I come with one. It doesn't matter because we are one. The Bible says where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. If your heart is in your marriage, your money is in your marriage. And then from that one kitty, we divvy out what is necessary to keep the home going. The mortgage can come out of there. The utility bills can come out of there. The this and that and the other, the food, the groceries can come out of there. My allowance that we are going to agree on your allowance, we take out and we put in our individual accounts. Why? Because I'm an adult. And if I want to spend my money on pizza, that's my prerogative. You have no right to ask me, why did you buy pizza? It's my money. And I chose to buy pizza with it. You have your own allowance. If you want to go and buy a Ferrari, go and buy a Ferrari. That's your headache. As an adult, I should have money that I have control over and that I can use as I want. And I don't have a husband breathing down my neck. How did you spend that? What did you do? Da, 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 da. And I'm not going to ask you to what you did with your money to your allowance. But there's an agreement that that allowance is good for two weeks or one month, depending on how the income comes into the home. So if your allowance is $10 for two weeks, if you spend it on day one, I'm sorry, you're not getting anything else till the next uh, pay cycle. That way there's no quarrel, there's no mistake, there's nothing. Because I, I've counseled many, many a couple who have had challenges with finances. Men complain that the women spend all the time. I just laugh. Women spend all the time. There's no question about that. If you're talking about frequency of spending, women spend all the time. But when it comes to the size of spending, we're nowhere near you guys. Because you're one thing that you want. <laughs> it can be it can be some device, it can be some new toy, it can be anything. That one purchase is equal to my 10 purchases. At least that's the pattern I've seen with couples. So I may go out and spend five dollars, two dollars, one dollar, three dollars, ten dollars, five dollars, and you think I spend too much. But when you go out and you spend, you spend a hundred dollars. So who spent more? You should have some kind of system that works for you where there's no quarrel about money. You cannot be fighting about money. The Bible says where your heart is, there your treasure is. If I don't have your wallet, who should? As your wife, if I do not have your wallet, who should? Praise God forevermore. I'll take offering from the women when we're done. I've told your men. <laughs> Hallelujah. But God designed these things to be so. And in even Levi, God level, levies the man more. 
because he expects more from him. Word of God. All right. Uh, when they offer a beast, beast becomes holy unto the Lord. He cannot change his mind. You say, no, that's not the one I wanted to give. This is the one I wanted to give. All right, go and break the money you wanted to give. Both have now become gods. Because if you've given something to God, whether it's good or bad, you can't take it back. Go and bring the good one to redeem yourself, but you can't take the bad one back. All right? Same thing with the field. If you sanctify a part of the field, all the proceeds from that field, that part that you sanctified belong to God. I have six acres of land. I grow corn. And I've sanctified uh, half of it to the Lord. All the proceeds from the half goes to the Lord. Is what uh, God is trying to tell these people here. If you give out the entire land to the Lord at the time of Jubilee, it comes back to you. Um, if you want to redeem it before that time, you are, you are allowed to redeem it, but you must add a fifth part thereof. When the field is released at Jubilee, it remains holy to the Lord as a field that was devoted to the Lord. So the possession will go to the priests. If a man sanctifies the Lord a field that he bought, which is not part of what he owned originally, the priest will reckon the worth of it to him to the year of Jubilee, and then the man will give that estimation on that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. In particular, the tithe. The Bible says you cannot use the tithe. If you do and you're bringing it back, you owe him 20%. And I do believe God did that as a deterrent. Anyone who understands money knows you don't want to pay 20% on borrowed money. That's madness. You don't mind earning 20% on your money, but you certainly don't want to pay interest of 20%. God says when you're bringing it back, add 20% to it. So it's a deterrent you bother to take or use it. Give God what is his first. And watch him bless the remainder. And these are the commandments that God commanded Moses at Mount Sinai concerning the children of Israel. That brings us to the end of Leviticus. Any questions, any thoughts? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Anyone? Glory to God. I'm not doing badly. June, July, August. Thank you, Lord. All right. If you don't have any questions or any thoughts, even if it's unrelated to what we have studied, I think we can bring our study to a close. And on Monday, we'll start with the book of Numbers. Tomorrow is our day to pray. Um, I hope you all saw the testimony of the hurricanes on the Telegram chat. God is faithful. I was excited when I read that this morning. Uh, thank you, Angela, for staying on top of it. Um, even they themselves use their mouth to say less than minimal damage. Meanwhile, before the storms, they had been saying all manner of things. I want to thank God for answering our prayers. We continue to push and to press until it becomes second nature to walk in the fullness of who we are, recognizing that we're spirit beings before we are human beings. Thank you, Lord, for answering prayers and for the diversion of the, of the storm and for the reduction in the intensity of the wind. Grateful. 